All right. Good, good evening. Um, I'm Monterey County Supervisor Luis Alejo, and I want to welcome everyone to this virtual town hall on Zoom um, on our Monterey County budget. I first want to have our Spanish interpreter, Diego Celis, to make his announcement for anyone who needs Spanish uh, translation today. Diego, you want to make your announcement? Uh, can you please repeat, uh, Supervisor? If you want to make your, your, your announcement just for those uh, who need Spanish interpretation. Okay, so we're not doing the meeting simultaneously, the whole meeting work. Oh, right? yeah. No, just uh, if you can make your quick minute. announcement in Espanol. Muy bien, muy buenas tardes a todos. Uh, bienvenidos a la reunión del Ayuntamiento, Distrito 1, Supervisor Luis Alejo. Esta tarde seré su intérprete de inglés español, español inglés. Mi nombre es Diego Celis. Por favor, hablar lenta y claramente para que yo lo escuche bien. También, favor, hacer una pausa entre sus oraciones para tener la oportunidad de interpretarle. Muchas gracias. And, and if you could tell them if they need um, tra Spanish translation, there is a global button at the bottom of the screen that says interpretation. They could click on that and it will take you to your screen so they could hear the Spanish translation. So he's currently doing the translation in his own channel. He he oh. is simultaneously able to translate a current. Perfect. Yes. All right. Thank you for that, um, Diego Celis. And before we have a, a brief a budget presentation by our budget director, Ezequiel Vega, I just wanted to make some quick announcements. This workshop is intended to provide an additional opportunity for the residents of my district, District 1, um, on the Board of Supervisors. But we also open this up for other members of the public. Um, um, because we wanted uh, to give an opportunity, additional opportunity to weigh in and provide any input on our county budget um, on, on what you want to see included, because next Wednesday, the Board of Supervisors will hold its budget meeting starting at 9.30 in the morning, and you can join in person uh, in the Monterey Room, which is on the second floor, because our chambers is currently under construction, or you can join also on Zoom. Um, and we wanted to let the public know today that if you want to make comments next Wednesday, the public comments portion will be at 1.30 p.m. Um, just so I know people need to plan for that sometimes because of work or their busy schedule during the day. But um, we also know that many people cannot participate during the day. So this today is a chance um, for you to provide input to me as your supervisor and also to my team who will be taking notes um, after uh, the budget director Vega's presentation. We will also open it up for any public comments on the county budget for anything you would like to address. It could be on anything from concerns over childcare, uh, health, including our Natividad Hospital or our county clinics. Uh, you could have ideas on the budget regarding our roads, our homelessness, education, jobs, housing, storm damage, or any other issues that are important to you. Uh, but before I, I pass the mic to Mr. Vega, I just wanted to point out a few highlights of things happening in, in my district, District 1. Um, first of all, as we all know, this year, um, I am proud to serve as a chair of the Board of Supervisors as of January. And, and it's really been a very challenging year, uh, starting with the January storms. And then shortly after that, we went into the March storms, including the Pajaro floods on March 11th. And now we are in the recovery phase to help our communities get through these very difficult times and also all the damage that was sustained to our communities. Uh, so, but through all these storms, um, I've been very active in stepping up to help our residents in need um, at our shelters, helping raise donations, and also assisting families with numerous problems that they've been facing. Um, here in Salinas, I've been active in helping with the expansion of the Salinas Regional Soccer Complex. We just broke, broke ground on the new phase to build two artificial fields, a mini stadium, more parking. Um, it, it's gonna be add to even more opportunities at the soccer complex. Um, and I'm also working to bring a new skate and bike park to Salinas for our youth to give them more recreational opportunities after school and on the weekends. And it will be right next door to the soccer complex. Um, right now, we're also very proud that we're making a lot of progress on our a uh, new um, $20 million behavioral health clinic, uh, which is being built on Sanborn Road. And it's gonna serve primarily children and their parents, um, but 
a lot of progress has been done on the construction and we really want to thank our county health department for investing those dollars in East Salinas. Um, I've also been trying to open a, a new county supervisor office in East Salinas uh, that, so that we can provide greater services to our residents in District 1 where we know that the need is very great. Um, earlier this year, we found a possible location, uh, but unfortunately that, that, that site didn't work out after all. So the search for a new office in East Salinas will continue in the new fiscal year starting in July. Um, last thing I wanted to mention was that we know that many families in Monterey County still don't have reliable or affordable internet access. And so Supervisor Lopez, uh, Chris Lopez and I have been leading efforts to close the digital divide here in Monterey County because we know that uh, the internet is essential for everyday life, uh, for school, for work, healthcare, and many other necessities. So we're making some good progress, but there's a lot more to do in the coming year. Um, this last January, I was very proud that the state assembly speaker, Anthony Rendon, appointed me to serve as the first local government representative on the Broadband Middle Mile Advisory Committee. Uh, this is the committee that is overseeing the implementation of the 10,000 mile broadband fiber project so that we can make reliable internet service available to all Californians. Uh, so I'm proud to be able to serve on a statewide committee on such an important uh, mission for California. Uh, so that's that's all I have uh, to, for, to report on some brief items. So now it's my honor to introduce Mr. Ezequiel Vega, our budget director. Um, who has been doing a lot of work trying to keep our county budget balanced, and we have some more challenging years ahead of us. Uh, so I'm going to pass the mic to him to make a brief presentation. After that, we will take public comments, and we also wanted to announce that if you don't want to speak but you have a question, you could also make it on the chat comments as well. So with that, I'll pass it to Mr. Vega. And this is being recorded, so we will make this uh, recording available to post on the YouTube channel and also on our social media as well. Mr. Vega, I'll pass it to you. Thank you for that, Supervisor Alejo. Um, as indicated, my name is Ezequiel Vega, and I'll be making a brief presentation regarding the budget. The budget for the county is uh, extremely complex, and sometimes pre this, uh, presentations could take long, but I want to focus on some of the key elements and some important decisions that the Board of Supervisors will have to make uh, as part of the budget hearings upcoming in uh, the next week on May 31st. Uh, so I hope that you could see my screen well uh, in the presentation I began to share. So thank you for that. So as indicated before, this is gonna be a brief presentation. Uh, the, what we're talking about during this presentation is gonna be the fiscal year 23-24 recommended budget. And this will be presented to the Board of Supervisors next week. We also did a presentation that will be available also online for a, a more detailed presentation to the budget committee that just occurred yesterday. So the overall uh, overview of the presentation, we will be focusing on an overview of the budget itself, what some of the costs and revenue drivers are. We will focus primarily on the general fund since the general fund is the one that uh, has the most impact in the overall provision of services to the community. And then we will just talk also about some key decisions that the Board of Supervisors will have to make during the budget hearings. So the overall uh, budget process works as you can see on this slide in front of you. Uh, and it starts sometime in early um, November and then continues all the way through June for budget adoption. And it starts with departments looking at the available resources that they have available for provide uh, services. They also look at revenue that is generated by the revenue by the general fund. And once they look, look at the balance between the revenues that they will be receiving for the year and the expenses that they'll be uh, incurring to provide services, if there is an imbalance where the expenditures are higher than the revenues, then they have something like they call an augmentation. And you will see during the budget hearings that there is a lot of conversation about augmentations and departments will come in and present that to the board of supervisors and will focus on the needs that haven't been met in order to continue to provide services to the community. And in some instances, we want, they want to start new services for which funding has not yet been identified. So that's in brief how this works. And all of that is what is called the requested budget. And our office works with those departments to review the requests that they have. And then we put all, everything together in a big comprehensive budget book that is typically fairly large, uh, 600 pages or longer. 
but we're going to try to summarize some of the key important aspects of the budget in the upcoming slides. This slide that follows just gives you some of the similar information that was presented in the previous slide, but just gives you more of a written format on a table format in case this is easier for you to read. So this will be available as indicated before in the recording. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide itself, but I think it will provide you more feedbacks as you refer back to the budget process and how you could get involved in this process. And as you can see, I think the important part of this slide is that there are specific windows of opportunity for you as the public to be able to provide feedback to your supervisors. Obviously we have this uh, presentation today for district one, but you also have the opportunity to come and speak to your board members throughout the year. But especially if there is something that you want to talk to them about that you would like to be included in the budget because it's important for the services in your community. You could provide that feedback to them in a formal setting during the budget workshop that you could see there in the middle of the screen on the gray area highlighted uh, uh, header. And you see during April, that happened about uh, a little over a month ago. That's an opportunity to you to provide feedback. You also could provide feedback in the coming week where we will be having the budget hearings. And then again, you have another opportunity to provide that feedback formally uh, during the budget adoption. But prior to that, you could always have been in communication with your board office about things that are important for you so that uh, we could plan as a county for those important services that you think are important in your community that need to be provided. So the recommended budget for next fiscal year uh, is uh, recommended at $847 million for uh, the general fund. The general fund uh, consists of many services that you are familiar with from social services, the health department, uh, uh, public works, many of those uh, services that touch your day-to-day -day, uh, lives. And on this $847 million, uh, the majority of those services are being provided, uh, as you can see in the general fund. Other services that you also see for the county budget itself are provided by Natividad Medical Center. Many uh, may not know that Natividad Medical Center is part also of the county, but they also provide critical health needs for the community. And in addition to that, you also see the Behavioral Health Fund, where there is a lot of need in the community for mental health services and substance abuse services. That is a very important aspect of this also. And the county's budget is providing $166 million to be able to address the mental health uh, needs of the community. And when you look at the breakdown for the general fund, this is uh, what I was discussing earlier, part of the general fund. You have social services where the county is allocating $260 million for those type of services that provide the services to the community that are important, also $150 million for the sheriff's department and $142 million for the health department. So overall, you can see that there are many important services that are being provided community-wide and the borders and this recommended budget actually allocates a significant dollar amount for those services. As an example, 33% of the general fund is going to social services and 18% of that is also going to the health department for health type of services in the community. The challenges with continuing to provide services over time is that expenses have been growing significantly for the county over the many years and the revenue that we have to provide those services in particular in the general fund have not been growing uh, consistently with the revenue. So expenditures have been growing at a higher pace than revenues. So there, that's why you typically, when you see a budget presentation to the board of supervisors, they always have difficult decisions to make because their resources are limited. And even though $836 million sounds like a lot in terms of revenue for the general fund, is not sufficient to meet all the needs in the community. Uh, and also it is important to know that out of those 836 million, only about 310 million of that is what is called discretionary revenue. What that means is that out of the 836 million, approximately uh, 500,000 million, 500, 500 million are specifically dedicated for a purpose. For example, in the health department, those services need to be provided for, for example, primary care clinics or some of the services that have to be provided by social services are for a specific program like food stamps and things of that nature. And then the rest of it, the $310 million is what the board of supervisors has a little more discretion as to how to spend those dollars. So those dollars are typically provided to different departments for provision of services based on a formula that has been predetermined in prior years that uh, tend to, uh, to mirror 
the overall priorities that the board of supervisors have provided for staff in prior years. Uh, as I told you in previous slides, I think that the costs continue to grow to a significant pace. And one of those costs that continue to grow for the county is the overall cost of salaries and benefits. And you see that actually salaries and benefits have increased significantly from fiscal year 21, 22 into the following fiscal year 22, 23. And that similar trend of continued growth is also evident in fiscal year 23, 24. So it is something that the board of supervisors will have to deal with in the upcoming uh, budget where this continued growth of salaries and benefits is gonna come to a, a point where there will not be sustainable. And it's very likely that the board will have to make decisions that have a potential reduction of services, not for fiscal year 23, 24, but potentially for fiscal year 24, 25. Similar to that uh, cost uh, increase in salaries and benefits, you see something similar like that also for health insurance premiums where those costs continue to grow and continue to impact the overall bottom line of the county. And another important aspect of the overall uh, cost structure for the county is also the cost for pensions where they continue, that cost continues to grow over the, the years. But the, what is important to know that is actually that the Board of Supervisors has been very proactive on recognizing that this is one of the significant cost pressures that the county has to face and they establish a separate 115 pension trust to be able to set aside some funding to be able to start paying down some of this liability for pensions so that in the future that cost will eventually be less impactful for operations and they are freeing up ongoing revenue so that in the future the county will be better positioned to be able to provide more of those important services to the community rather than spending in some of these type of obligations. So one, so one of the important decisions that the Board of Supervisors is going to have to make during the upcoming uh, budget hearing next week is going to be related also to the cannabis program. As you can see from this chart, the cannabis revenue that has been received from the county was significant over the last few fiscal years, but the cannabis industry has been facing significant challenges uh, on sustaining operations. So uh, there have been some changes that have been approved in the terms of the rate of tax collection for this industry. And it is projected that we're gonna receive approximately $4.6 million as part of the recommended budget. But uh, after uh, conversations and when the recommended budget was being developed, program staff in the cannabis program indicated that revenues will be much lower than that. So given that conversation, the Board of Supervisors had directed the cannabis program to go back and develop a plan that will ensure that the revenues that are gonna be received under this program will match and the overall expenditures for the program as well. So the board is gonna be asked to make a specific reduction to this program so that the revenues that are coming in for this program will be sufficient to cover the ongoing expenditures for the program itself. In addition to that decision, the board of supervisors will also be uh, uh, approving as part of the recommended budget, the use of the continued use of ARPA money. If you recall what this means is the affordable, um, I'm sorry, the American Rescue Plan Act. The American Rescue Plan Act provided some funding to counties and cities in order for them to continue to provide services and help those impacted by the pandemic of the last few fiscal years. So the county received $84.3 million and the Board of Supervisors judiciously approved a plan to use those funds over a, a three and a half year span so that we will have the ability to respond to the pandemic. And given that this type of funding was available, the Board of Supervisors actually used some of this funding to establish a program like the VITA project. I think that may, some of you may be familiar with that, that specific uh, program where there were some uh, community health workers that will go out into the community, provide information about COVID vaccination, the safety of them, be able to reach out to the community and help those in need also that needed to be isolated and provide the appropriate resources for them so that they'll be able to be directed and isolated in, in situations where they couldn't otherwise and prevent the spread of COVID over the last few years. So that's just one of the important pro pro programs that was funded out of this, this funding. This funding is gonna be coming to an end with the fiscal year 23, 24. So the county is gonna also have to make important decisions once that funding is expired, uh, beginning with, with fiscal year 24, 25, and potentially make some reductions. But some of those uh, programs that have been beneficial to the community will have to somehow be evaluated and determined if we could find other funding sources to be able to sustain some of those important services into the community. 
So as I mentioned before, uh, uh, the departments are gonna be making uh, presentations to the Board of Supervisors during the budget hearings regarding the budget gaps that they had uh, for the upcoming fiscal year. And what those budget gaps are called, they are called augmentations. So the department submitted a total of $40.9 million that were above and beyond the revenue that was available. Uh, and of that, an additional $82.5 million for capital needs of the county for a total unfunded need of $123.5 million. So we evaluated in the county administrative office uh, the different requests from the departments, try to determine what could be funded from these augmentations that the department submitted. And we uh, prepared the recommended budget, recommended to the Board of Supervisors to fund augmentation requests from departments up to $28.8 million. And some of those uh, augmentations were being recommended by using some of the ARPA dollars that you saw on a couple of the previous slides. And also some of the revenue that you see here on this column from departments saying we have almost $10 million in revenue and we want to implement this program. So we evaluated that and also recommended those programs to be funded to the Board of Supervisors. So with that, uh, that is the end of the formal actual presentation. I don't want to bore you with a lot of ideas in the budget, but I think it is important for you to see what the magnitude of some of these uh, decisions that the Board of Supervisors will have to make on the coming uh, budget hearings, and also for you to have an opportunity to use ask questions about the process itself or anything that was presented today during this presentation. So with that, I'll conclude my presentation and I'm ready for any question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vega. We appreciate the brief overview of the budget. There is a lot. Um, as you mentioned, we have a $1.8 billion budget. The county is one of the largest employers. We have over 5,400 employees. So what we do at the county really impacts uh, people all across Monterey County. And despite these challenges that you're mentioning, these increased costs, it's going to be a tighter budget this year. It's going to get probably more difficult next year and the year after that. But there is an opportunity for the public to weigh in when they, they are needs um, or make these community ask um, during these hearings. Uh, we want the public to know that they, they, they do have that opportunity and that they can ask the supervisors and all our staff for things they, they feel are important and should be better addressed in our budget. Uh, so um, we're very proud. Before we go to the question and answer questions, we're really honored to have our county CAO, uh, Sonia De La Rosa. Um, she started in late December, early January with us, uh, went through the same thing we all went through, um, a very challenging year um, at, since the beginning of the year. But we're very proud because she is a, a native daughter to Monterey County, a, um, a native daughter to King City in particular, but um, came up and worked a lot of, most of her career in Fresno County and started as our new CAO. So we're really uh, honored to have her here and to join us and to also just say some words about the budget and just perhaps maybe start by introducing herself um, to, to folks uh, as this is being recorded as well for folks to also watch later. Absolutely, and thank you for the opportunity to, to just make a couple comments. I think uh, one of the things I wanna do first is really thank the budget team. Ezequiel leads a great budget team that was able to work with our departments to put this budget together um, for your board's review. Um, this At this point, it's a recommended budget, so it's it really is just a draft to show um, potentially where these dollars will go. Um, I did join the, the county in, um, in early January, but I did come in before that because of the emergencies, and the budget was pretty much already uh, well on its way. Departments were already providing some of their feedback. Um, you know, and into the future, what we hope to do is have a more active, um, more in, uh, integrated uh, discussion with the public throughout the year, because there's questions that have come up in terms of when is the best time to start telling folks, this is what we need in our community. Um, is it now or is it you know, at the end of the year. So really it's more information going out to the community about how they can become engaged and how the budget is put together. Um, there's a lot of dollars that come into the county that do come from the state and the federal government that come with those strings attached and they're designated for specific uh, purposes, specific services. So those discretionary dollars are the ones that allow for that little bit more of flexibility, uh, but there's only a certain amount, of course, of, of dollars available. Um, in addition to that, I think one of the things that we've all have seen is that there's been a lot of one-time dollars, such as CARES a few years ago, and now 
the American rescue dollars that are um, you know, coming to an end fairly soon. And that does require then for a decrease in, in services that were bolstered with dollars that were meant to support um, COVID response throughout the county. So I think going forward is just that continued diligence on behalf of our budget team and then keeping the public informed when there is going to be a change of resources with the hope that we'll be able to um, bring in some grants that would support us, but also continue that looking for additional resources that may be able to bolster how we provide services throughout the county. And then also doing it in different languages. One of the things that we did see um, that was so important during these last emergencies was that ability to have the translation and interpretation services available, not just what we're doing today and through Zoom, but also in person for some of the individuals that <clears throat> have the indigenous uh, background that communicate better in a language uh, from where they're from and then having those resources available on hand in person so that people feel comfortable sharing um, some of the details that they're going through and some of the resources that they need. So I truly look forward to continuing to work with our team with the Sequiel and the entire group um, as we work to to look at how we could serve, continue to serve better when we know that resources are going to be a little tight in the coming years. So thank you. Thank you, CAO De La Rosa, for those comments. And I was just at a Cal OES training in Sacramento, and, and that was one of the things they wanted to highlight about Monterey County, about um, providing that greater language access for emergency services. So thanks to you and to the com communications team and the emergency services team, because it's being recognized around the state that that is critical. As everybody knows, um, whether in English or Spanish, but now we know there's some other languages in our county that people really need to get that accurate info and fast uh, during those emergency uh, moments. Um, okay, so I think uh, we're gonna just first call, if, if there's anybody who has a question, they can just raise their hand or uh, put it, that question in the chat. Um, and if we see any raised hands, we'll call on those. But in the meantime, I'm going to ask for um, Maya Carroll or Nick Pasquale to read off uh, some of the questions that we received so far for um, Budget Director Vega. I'll go ahead. I've got some questions in chat that I can share. We can start. Uh, first question is, how are budget decisions made for funding services for those in need? So overall, uh, funding decisions uh, are made based on pri prior priorities of the Board of Supervisors and the specific feedback that they have received from the public in the past. So uh, for example, the county has, as the supervisor uh, Alejo indicated, approximately $1.9 billion, right? Of that $1.9 billion, there is a certain dollar amount that is categorical. So it has to be spent on specific services. For example, when you saw the presentation earlier, you saw approximately 400 million that uh, were part of the Natividad's budget. That is something that you could consider categorical because it has to be spent specifically for the provision of services at the hospital and as hospital type of services. So that type of funding will, will be specifically earmarked for that purpose. So that's the way the decisions are made. First, you look at the nature of the funding that is available. You look at the prior priorities that have been set by the Board of Supervisors by direction that they provided as part of the budget hearings or in specific policies that they have uh, implemented. And then those decisions are distributed to the different departments to, who implement those policy decisions. And then as revenue continues to grow in different areas, then the formula, uh, there's a formula that actually incrementally allocates those dollars to the different departments. However, that doesn't mean that that formula is the only way to allocate funds in the future, but that is the way that it has happened for Monterey County. And as we face difficult challenges ahead of us for fiscal year 24, 25, I think that we're gonna to have to have a harder look at, to, to look at those programs that are being more effective, that, pro, that provide the most impact to the community and that uh, are important to the overall to the community. And that is something that we're gonna to have to look at for the following fiscal year. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and we have another question in the chat. Um, the county had to spend a lot of money during the storms um, and flooding. Will that affect other county services? It affected county services when those uh, storms and emergencies were happening because a lot of resources were being diverted in some instances to be able to respond to the emergencies. But in terms of ongoing revenue, it, it could potentially impact revenue. So far, we haven't seen that uh, impact in revenue, for example, in transient occupancy taxes or property taxes or other things like that. 
but in the future, we may see some of those impacts and potentially that could impact services. But in the short term, given that uh, we, the county and the Board of Supervisors had a strong uh, financial policies where we had set uh, strategic reserves in place to be able to respond to this, or to this type of emergencies, we have been able to tap into those one-time uh, resources to be able to respond to the uh, emergency for the most part. But if we continue to have this type of emergencies in the future, it's, it's, it's pot potentially something that could affect the county. But right now, I don't anticipate that happening for the current fiscal year and also into next fiscal year. Thank you, and Mr. And Mr. Vega. Um, I know well, last Tuesday at the Board of Supervisors, we talked uh, on, on having to use a lot of strategic reserves. This is money that we usually set aside for emergency purposes, but because of the storms, and so much damage to roads, bridges, sewer systems, water systems that the, the county has to front that money and take money out of our reserves uh, to do the work and then um, get reimbursed later by FEMA. And that takes several years to get the money reimbursed. But that was one of our um, big new issues just because the, the damage was so great uh, with the storms in January and March, correct? That's correct. And I, th I think one of the other questions that uh, was in the chat also is related to FEMA, the following question. So I think it's good to also talk about FEMA. So FEMA reimbursement, unfortunately, takes a long time for us to receive it. So typically, we do not uh, account for that in the budget. We cannot plan for it because we don't really know when it will be available. But the important part about this is that we actually need to document those costs very carefully to make sure that we submit claims to FEMA on time. And then we just track that revenue reimbursement. So when that revenue comes back into the county, we will be able to replenish that strategic reserve that you referred to earlier, Supervisor Alejo, and that the county was able to actually utilize during this time. So those are uh, the good news is that we did have the strategic reserve to help us with that. So we're gonna have to be building FEMA and hopefully over the next three to five years, we'll see a significant amount coming back to the county so that we could reestablish that reserve again so that we are prepared for the next emergency that we may be facing. Great, thank you. And you did, uh, this next question was about FEMA, but I wanna ask you to answer it again. When money, the question was when money comes in from FEMA for emergencies, how is that accounted for in the budget? And it's also something you said people don't realize it doesn't, uh, reimbursement doesn't happen right away. So maybe you could talk about accounting for and tracking. Yeah, the accounting for in the budget, we actually do not account for that in the budget because as indicated before, we don't know the timing of the reimbursement. So what we do is that we continue working with FEMA and the department that is in charge of billing FEMA. And then we just track it to make sure that we are receiving everything that the county is supposed to receive in terms of reimbursement. And when it comes in, it's, it's recognized in the books as one-time revenue. And then at the end of the year, we have excess revenue. Then we use that to backfill the strategic reserve to use it for contingencies or potentially if the contingencies and the strategic research are fully funded in accordance with county policies. And if we still have some excess revenue at that point, we could use that for some capital projects for improvements of buildings. It could potentially be used for essentially any purpose at that point because at that point it would become discretionary revenue. Okay, great, thank you. And another question. Um, so. Does the budget include money to support future emergencies, given the fact that uh, we had this uh, doozy this last uh, winter? Um, do we, is there money for future emergencies? So the, I think that the funding that we have set aside as a, as a county has been that strategic reserve. So we have two separate parts of fund, funding. One of them is the contingencies, so that we have emergencies throughout the year that we could respond to those in a short order. The Board of Supervisors Financial Policy said, 1% of the overall general fund revenues into those con that contingency fund. For fiscal year 23, 24, the amount of uh, contingency is $7.9 million. And then also the Board of Supervisors financial policy says a policy of 10% of overall revenue from the general fund as the strategic reserve target. And over the last few fiscal years, we have been able to successfully meet that target. And that target was $79 million uh, for the last fiscal year, fiscal year 22-23. Currently, that strategic reserve is sitting at approximately 48 million. And then the Board of Supervisors just recently approved the use of an additional 20 million for additional repairs caused by the second set of storms that hit the county sometime in March. So that will bring the balance into the mid $20 million and that strategic reserve. So the way that we will have to plan for future Emergencies is to continue to replenish those 
areas that for the strategic reserve and contingencies to make sure that we're able to respond to that. But obviously we cannot predict what will happen. So it's not something that we uh, uh, incorporate into operating budgets. But what we do is that we set that money aside and we do provide a certain dollar amount for the Department of Emergency Management just to deal with some of the minor type of emergencies that we could encounter. But if we face something really major, then we will not be able to deal that uh, as part of the ongoing budget. We will have to look at the strategic reserve and contingencies to be able to respond to that. Thank you. And here's our next question. When could we see an economic downturn in Monterey County? Yes, if I had a crystal ball, that would be great. <laughs> but I could tell you that. But we, we do anticipate right now, but we don't have a crystal ball, but we have something that call, is called financial forecasting. And that is one of the good practices that we have implemented in this county over the many years. And based on the latest forecast, we anticipate that we're going to have some financial challenges coming into fiscal year 24, 25. Part of the reason is because some of the one-time funding that we have received that helped us during the pandemic. And also prior to that, uh, uh, we received CARES and the American Rescue Plan Act funds, what we call ARPA. So that helped us to weather some of that, uh, those challenges that we have with the pandemic. Uh, but in go going into next fiscal year, we anticipate that revenues are not gonna be sufficient to cover all the costs. That will be fiscal year 24, 25. So we anticipate that at that point, we're gonna have to make some reductions. In addition to that, we are monitoring closely what is happening at the state and federal level. So when you actually look at what is happening at the, at the state level, the state is projecting a deficit of $31.5 billion for next fiscal year. That is not affecting the county for fiscal year 23, 24 yet, but we anticipate that some of that is gonna to start to trickle down into fiscal year 24, 25 also. And it's gonna pro probably affect the most, some of those departments that are more dependent on a state and federal revenue, you know, like the departments of social services and the health department and some of other, those others that get grants and state revenues as well. And before that, if something happens at the federal level, you, we all have heard what is going on with the debt ceiling negotiations and the inflation that is impacting on the overall, on the overall uh, country. So if something like that was to occur in the middle of the fiscal year in 23, 24, then we'll just have to monitor that. Right now, we do not anticipate a recession coming during that in the next uh, 12 months, but you never know what will happen if something like the debt ceiling uh, negotiations don't actually come to a positive result. It could uh, really have a significant impact on the, on the county, the state, and the nation, and the world. Thank you very much for that. Um, and um, another question you know, we have in the chat, obviously these disasters taught us a lot about the issue of housing, um, but why isn't there more money being spent on homelessness and housing and how can the county spend more or get more money for affordable housing? Yeah, I think that that's a very difficult question uh, because I think that as I mentioned before, this could be answered in multiple parts. I think one of the parts that we could just be looking at is that a lot of the revenue that we do receive for the county is categorical in nature. As indicated before, a large portion of that revenue that we receive is earmarked for a specific purpose. Also, the amount of revenue that we do have as discretionary revenue has to be used for certain things that is specifically dedicated for mandates. The county has a lot of mandates. For example, the county has to run and operate the jail, the county jail. And that requires a lot of resources with uh, sheriff deputies uh, taking care of the inmates in the jail. And it has a specific set amount of funding that we have to cover. We also, as a county, have to pay debt service for certain bonding that the county has utilized over time to improve the county's facilities or to meet maintenance of effort requirements for social services programs or meet the maintenance of effort also to be able to provide funding to the road fund in, the, in order to receive revenue for, from, from Measure X and SB1 to be able to continue maintaining roads. So a lot of those uh, restrictions and funding create a challenge for the Board of Supervisors to have that flexibility to dedicate more funding to homelessness. But I think that there is always an opportunity to continue seeking grants through the federal government and also looking at the specific funding that is being provided at the federal level to uh, improve on some of that. And I think that that is going to be a significant challenge facing us, uh, Monterey County, and also multiple counties throughout the state as the homelessness uh, problem continues to grow, to be creative uh, on how we could potentially use some of those, those funds. And at some point, it is, it is likely 
that they have to, there's going to have to be a reprioritization uh, for the county and many counties throughout the state as to how we utilize funding uh, for certain programs. Some programs that are not uh, probably producing the results that we need would have to be eliminated and maybe redirected to something like this. And I think that Sonia wants to say something. She's an expert, as I understand it, in <laughs> this area of homelessness. Uh, I'll, 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 let's, let's, let's listen to what she has to say. So one of the things that we are doing is um, Roxanne, who works um, on our, is the homelessness coordinator, is actually looking at different ways that we can support our homeless population. And then uh, affordable housing is also being worked on with the Department of um, Housing and Community Development. And we're looking at potential resources at the state level, but then also looking um, for support from the housing authority. Um, we do have a new housing authority director. Zulika Boykin is very interested in projects that we may have moving forward. And I think Supervisor Alejo could probably speak also to the, uh, the housing um, opportunity uh, to build in, at 855 um, East Laurel, I believe. And also um, in conversations with Zulika, we've also talked about senior housing. So I think it is going to take um, leveraging of different resources, um, not just um, you know vouchers from the housing authority, but a mix of resources in order to make this happen. And it's already being worked on um, as we speak. There's already conversations that are happening also with our behavioral health team um, for those individuals that are experiencing a serious mental illness or have family that have experienced a serious mental illness. We're trying to strategize different ways to try to bring in folks into housing, whether it's affordable housing or homeless um, housing, um, meaning that there's wraparound services and other resources that individuals can access. So I think Supervisor, you can probably speak to 855. Yeah, de definitely. And I think uh, I just want all our residents who, who are watching or may watch this later to know that I think housing and homelessness are one of our, our two, among our top two issues in Monterey County, because we hear so much from our residents that that needs to be better addressed. Um, but we started with our county properties that were sitting vacant. We we're moving with uh, in partnership with the city of Salinas and Eden Housing to build 130 units that will be affordable units uh, in the city limits of Salinas. And not too far away from that property, we have a proposal to build some affordable housing for our seniors because we know that. Our population is getting older here in Monterey County. We need to provide housing opportunities for them. But those are just two of our county properties that we're, we are starting with to set the example. But what, what's exciting about Monterey County is that there is numerous parts in the county where there are housing projects moving forward in East Garrison on the former Fort Ord, the city of Salinas. There was some news that they're moving to do a significant um, housing project. And then also cities of Gonzales and Soledad the unfortunate thing is that building housing just takes so long here that our laws need to be improved so that the groundbreaking could happen and we could get those housing constructed much faster. But there, there is uh, projects in the pipeline, I think more than any other county here in the Monterey Bay area. Um, um, so those are that's on the housing side. On the homelessness side, uh, we know that, as we said, housing takes some time. So we moved to convert some hotels for our homeless residents because we know that the shelter is not the long-term solution. We have we have a shelters, but we need to move them into some permanent housing. And so these hotel conversions um, um, that are in progress will provide opportunities for two to 300 homelessness residents. Uh, many of those are in Salinas, but there is a project moving in King City as well. And we hope to do more of those uh, throughout the county. The only last thing I would say is that we our, our housing count which is called the point in time count. That's how the state and the federal governments measure homelessness in, in all our, our counties. Our, our homelessness counts have dropped two times already. Uh, two counts ago, it would drop 20%. This last one was 15%. I know sometimes our residents say um, they don't see the, the, the change happening, but at least in these official counts, it is happening. But we know that there's much more to do. But this is a critical question, and I'm glad it was asked. Yes, and uh, we have another question that came in from um, one of our um, uh, guests in your district, Supervisor. Um, what is the Sheriff's Office fiscal baseline in the counties responsible for? Um, and also the department budget continues to grow every year. So I, I think the, uh, the resident wants to have some uh, understanding of that. Um, Mr. Reggie, do you want to, uh, I, I know one of your slides mentioned the the sheriff's budget, I think in one of the charts, it showed that it was about 150 million. Correct, 
correct that's the um, dollar amount in the recommended budget yeah and right. that's it's it's 150 million and as part of that i think that maybe what uh this uh, resident will want to know is about the overall responsibility for the county as a mandate and i think that when we look at what we have to do as a county obviously we have to provide services to the community for public safety one of them is to continue to operate the jail so the baseline for that would be a minimum to be able to have the staffing to be able to safely operate that jail and also to be able to provide response to the community and the budget continues to grow for the sheriff's department as it also continues to grow for many other areas of the county because of the overall, overall cost of doing business and i think that what will be important as we are going to be facing significant budget challenges into next fiscal year fiscal year 24 25 that we evaluate all areas of the county and try to determine what is the uh, minimum amount of service that we could provide that will be safely providing those services to the community that we will still be able to provide quality services as well uh, so i think that that's just something that we have to continue to evaluate for the sheriff's department as well as any other department throughout the county yeah thank you very much and um i did just want to elaborate that the sh there's always these concerns on the patrol side you know because we're such a big county uh, it takes a couple hours of going from the north, driving all the way to South County. And so uh, it's balancing those concerns in response time uh, uh, from our sheriff patrol, but then also the jail, um, which um, our residents may know has been under the Hernandez lawsuit. The court has uh, mandated certain services, um, um, whether it's health care or other uh, costs that are required. And there's a monitor for that. So that has uh, placed some significant costs on the county to carry out those court orders as well. Um, but that's definitely a, a big topic and it will come up in our presentation next Wednesday. And uh, certainly um, I would invite the, the public, um, our, our residents to to um, add comments during public comments on any aspects of the budget, including the sheriffs at 1.30 p.m. Great. And there was a follow up question um, from the same person about how much does the county spend on jail operations? I've been looking through the, I saw that question earlier and I was looking through the budget book and I have to aggregate different uh, figures together. So what I will do is that I will provi provide that information at a later date. I don't want to give you the wrong number at this point because I want to, I have to be adding a few different tables together because the and all the overall costs are into different appropriation units in the budget book. And I think that this question was asked by Bernie. So we can make sure that Bernie gets this information as we get that and also make it available for the supervisor's office so in case the other constituents need to know that information it will be available there as well yeah and maybe for the presentation next wednesday we could just be prepared to just to just just give that number whatever it is uh, so that it's you know sometimes it all gets mixed together but there there's that separate cost of just the the, the jail operations as well yes and we will do that for the meeting as well yes all right thank you so much for that it looks like supervisor that's all the questions yeah. we had all right, um, I, I just wanted to announce um, um, for the community that um, my office will have its mobile office hours again. Uh, we've been very busy with the storms, but we will be at the Latino Farmers Market at the Rodeo Grounds on June 2nd. It's a Friday from 4 to 7 p.m. Um, um, and you don't need an appointment. Yeah, we, we try to get out there in the community, take our services to the community so that if you just have a question, um, they want to talk about a particular issue, me and my staff will be out there. And so we want to invite you to join us. Also, if, if the public does ever want to reach us by email, by phone, if they want to set up an appointment. Uh, but what I've been getting more frequently is contacts over social media, Twitter, messaging, Facebook, uh, Instagram. A lot, I get a lot more people using that uh, to add, get questions or getting help uh, for different issues that they may have. So I, that goes directly to me, and I make sure to respond to every single one of those that I, that I get. Um, and lastly, I just want to thank all our team, all our staff, our budget staff for helping us uh, provide this opportunity to uh, District 1 and to other Monterey County residents. So, and so um, lastly, we just want to congratulate all our high school and middle school graduates. This was graduation week, so I know that, that made it difficult for a lot of the residents to join us. Uh, but we want to congratulate them and also our, our university graduates. So we got a lot of our youth who are at universities all across our nation, and they're graduating. We want to just say how proud we are of them. And lastly, it is Memorial um, Weekend, and we want to just um, salute all our veterans and also pay tribute and remember all those who have passed away, um, who have made the ultimate sacrifice and service to our nation. So happy Memorial Day. With that, we thank you very much, and we'll uh, conclude this town hall. Thank you very much.